Hey, my name is Milan and in today's video we're going to talk about password hashing. We're going to discuss why password hashing is needed for securely storing your users' passwords and what is the most correct way to implement password hashing in .NET. This is going to be our starting point in the discussion about password hashing. I have a system where I have the register user use case and I also have a password hasher service registered as a singleton. Now, if I take a look at this implementation of the password hasher, you're going to see that it's not doing anything at the moment. It's just returning the original password. If I take a look at the register user use case, you can see I'm using the password hasher here before persisting the user inside of our database. Now, at this moment, our database is just an in-memory EF core database, which is fine for our use case. So let's actually check if the user registration is working. If I open up the Swagger UI, I can see the one endpoint that I have, and I want to send this request to our backend, and you can see I get back the user response. It has a new identifier assigned, and the password hash is returned in plain text format. So our password hasher isn't doing anything for the time being, which is what we are going to fix. Now, if I also try to send the same request again, I'm going to get an exception saying that the email is already in use. So our database seems to be working even though it's in memory. Now let's move our focus to password hashing. Why do we even need password hashing to begin with? The obvious answer is that we need password hashing to improve our system security. We need a way to store the passwords of our users in a way that allows us to verify that the user logging in is specifying the correct password, but also we don't want to store these passwords in plain text because this is a security vulnerability and it opens up a possibility for malicious actors to try to attack our system and use this vulnerability against us. So this is where password hashing comes in and this is fundamentally a simple process. We are taking something in plain text, which is the password of our user, applying a hash function to this plain text which is going to give us a hash text of a fixed value. So this is really all there is to it. Now, which hash function you use impacts how secure your system is going to be. There are hash functions that have been solved, quote unquote, which means a potential attacker is able to apply a brute force attack on your system and be able to figure out the passwords of your users if you are using a hash function that isn't strong enough. We're also going to discuss which hash function is the recommended one when it comes to security, so don't worry about that. Another quality of hash functions is that they are going to produce the same output for the same input. So if two users try to use the same password, they are going to end up with the same password hash, and this isn't necessarily a good thing. Hash functions are also used in common data structures in .NET, such as hash sets or dictionaries, where we need to be able to specify a value and then use the hash of that value as the key in the respective data structure. Now, in our case, we need a way to avoid duplicate password hashes for different users. And this is where the concept of salting a password comes in, which is just a random number added to our hash function. So now, instead of processing just the user's password to produce a hash, we're going to use the password and the random salt value, use both of them to produce the hash, which is going to guarantee uniqueness even when we have two users trying to use the same password because they will be using a different salt value. So let's see how we can apply all of these concepts inside of our code to implement password hashing. I'm going to start by defining a few constants on our password hasher class. So I'm going to create a private integer constant, which is going to represent the size of the salt value that we're going to be using in the algorithm. And the recommended size is at least 128 bits, which is 16 bytes. So I'm going to specify the salt size as 60. Then I'm going to define another constant to represent my hash size. And the recommended value here is at least 256 bits, which is 32 bytes. So these are going to be my default values. Then I need to specify another constant for the number of iterations that my hash function is going to run. And I'm going to start with 10,000. And one more thing that I need is the actual hash function that I want to apply, which is going to be represented with the hash algorithm name. Let's call this the algorithm. And I'm going to get this from a set of static values that we have defined inside of .NET. I'm going to use the SHA-512 algorithm, which is short for secure hash algorithm. And it's one of the more powerful hashing algorithms that we have in .NET. 
Now, when it comes to implementing the hash method, here's what we have to do. We first need a way to generate the random salt value. This is going to be an array of bytes. And how we can do this is using the random number generator class. And we can access the get bytes method, which is going to create an array of cryptographically strong random values, which is perfect for our use case. So let's specify the salt size here. And this is how we obtain our salt value. Then we need to generate our actual hash and how you can do this is using the RFC 2898 derived bytes class, which exposes this method called PBKDF2. If you are wondering what the heck does this even mean, this is short for password based key derivation function. And this function is described in the RFC 2898 inner standard, which is why we have weird names like this inside of .NET. But essentially, this is going to allow us to produce the password hash in a cryptographically safe way that is resistant to many brute force attacks. So let's check what are the arguments for this method. The first argument is going to be our plain text password. So let's go ahead and specify that because we already have it. Then we need to specify our salt, which we generated in the previous step. Then I'm going to specify the number of iterations that this function is going to execute internally to produce the hash value. The next argument is the algorithm name that we want to run, which is going to be SHA-512. And the last argument is going to be the output size, which is our hash size constant. Now, if you take a look, the iterations constant is marked with a red underline. And this is actually a code analyzer that I have in place, which is warning me that I have a problem. Now, before we address this, let's return our actual hash value by converting the array of bytes into a hex string. So I'm going to say convert to hex string and specify the hash, but I'm also going to include the salt because we're going to need it if we want to be able to verify the password. Otherwise, we would lose the salt value that was used to generate this unique hash. So let's say convert to hex string and let's also specify the salt value. Now, if you take a look here, the analyzer is warning me that I should use at least 100 iterations inside of my key derivation function. And this is mainly done for security reasons. So let's go ahead and listen to the suggestion here and update the number of iterations to 100,000. And the reason I specified 10,000 at the start is just to highlight this code analyzer. This is available in the Sonar Analyzer c -sharp package. So now that we implemented our hash function, let's go ahead and start the application again. And I'm going to send a post request to register a new user with this password. So let's click execute. And we will hit the breakpoint that I set inside of my password hasher. And the first step is going to be to generate the salt, which you can see is just an array of some random values. Then we're going to produce our hash, which is another array of numeric values. And finally, we're going to convert this into a string that we're going to return to our client. If we take a look at the response here, this is the hash that was produced for our user. And this is what we want to store inside of our database instead of the plain text password. Now, let me show you what happens if I specify a different email and we try to register this user with the same password. If you take a look at the password hash that was produced here, it's completely different from the value that was assigned to the other user because of the password salt, which is random. But this is just step one in our implementation. We also need to be able to verify a password hash when the user is logging in. So let's go ahead and define another use case inside of our users folder that I will call a login user. Let's go ahead and create this use case. And then I'm going to inject the two dependencies that I need, the user repository to fetch a user and the password hasher to be able to verify the user's password. Let me define our request object for this use case, which is going to be just an email and the password. And then I'm going to define a method that's going to contain the logic for this use case. Let's say I want to return a user object. I'm accepting my request as the only argument. And then in the implementation, the first thing I need to do is to try to fetch a user based on the email. So I will say user repository get by email. This is going to be an async method accepting an email. Let me go ahead and create this method. I will also have to implement this in the user repository. So let's do it quickly. I will say return await db context users, let's say single or default async. And we are looking for the user where the user's email is equal to the email argument. So this is our implementation. 
we can go back to our use case. So now that we have the user, we have to check if a user with this email exists. And if the user is null, let's go ahead and throw an exception. And I'm going to say the user was not found. Now the next step is the actual found part. I'm going to create a variable that's going to say if the user's password was successfully verified or not. And we're going to say password hasher verify, which is a method that we don't have yet, but don't worry about that. And I'm going to try to verify the password that was specified in this request and the user's password hash that we have stored in the database. So let's go ahead and say if not verified, then let's go ahead and throw another exception. And let's say the password is incorrect. And then I'm going to return the user. And before we implement this method, let's go ahead and expose another endpoint for logging in a user. So let's say map post login and I'm going to define the body as login user request and then I'm going to inject the actual use case as a service and finally I can say await use case handle and let's pass in the request so this exposes our endpoint now I'm also going to register the login user use case as a scoped service and now I can focus my attention on the password hasher and now if I go back to the use case I'm going to define this method called verify and the arguments are going to be a password and the password hash. Let's head over to the implementation and let's see what we need to do to implement this method. If you take a look at the previous method, we are returning the password hash where the first part is the actual hash value on the password and the second part is the salt that was randomly generated for this user. So what I have to do is first split the password hash into the respective parts so let's say split, and then I'm going to specify the separator, which is just the minus sign. Then I'm going to extract the array that represents my salt by saying convert from hex string, and I'm going to take the second part of my hash, but I will also need the actual hash value because this is what I'm going to use to compare to the specified password that we have here. So I'll say convert from hex string and specify parts of zero, which is our actual hash value. Then I need to define my input hash or rather generate it. And we're going to use our password based key derivation function. So let's specify the password here. Then the salt is the value that we got from the password hash that was stored in the database. So this is how we can use the same salt value to hash the incoming password. And then I need to specify the number of iterations, the algorithm, and the hash size that I need to return. An important remark with this implementation is that it's going to make it hard to change any of these values which are constant without affecting any of the existing passwords in your system. If you do want to be able to change the salt size, the hash size, the number of iterations, and even the algorithm, you're going to have to include that in the password hash that you are storing in the database, and then you can slowly phase out the passwords that are using the old approach. This is going to be a discussion for another video, but for now, let's see what we need to do to finish the verify method implementation. So the only thing that's left is to compare the hash to the input hash that we obtain by hashing this password here. Now, if you just attempt to do hash sequence equal to the input hash, you are going to get the correct behavior, but this opens up an attack vector called timing attacks, where the malicious actor can use the information about how long it takes to compare these two values to try to figure out what is the correct password hash. So in order to avoid this, it's recommended to use the cryptographic operations static class, which exposes a fixed time equals method. And here you can specify your hash and the input hash. And this is going to compare these two arrays based on the length of these arrays and not necessarily on how long it takes to compare the individual values. So let's start the application and let's check if the verify method is working as expected. Because I'm using an in-memory database, I will have to first register my user. So this is the correct password, password123. Now let's try to specify this in the login endpoint. So I'm going to specify password123, and then I will specify test at example.com as the user's email. Let's go ahead and send this request. And we're going to hit the breakpoint in the login user use case. So we first fetch the user from the database. You can see that this succeeds and we get the password hash for this user, 
which contains the hash of the actual password and the random salt value that was used to generate this hash. Now, if I step into the verify method, we're first going to split the password hash to obtain the two parts, use them to get back the hash value and the salt, which you can see are 32 and 16 byte arrays. Then we're going to calculate the input hash using the password that is specified as the first argument. And finally, we're going to compare these two values. So if this returns true, it means that we specified the correct password and we get back a response. Now, if I just change this to something different and we try to do the same use case again, you will see that in the verify step, we're going to return false because we are calculating a different hash value than the one that was used for this user. So we're going to throw an exception and that's going to bubble up to the client, which is going to see that the password is incorrect. And this is a secure way for how you can produce password hashes if you want to store your user's credentials. The only thing that's missing is to generate a respective access token. And this is something that I'm going to discuss in a future video. If you don't want to implement your own authentication mechanism from scratch, then you can take a look at a robust identity provider like Keycloak by watching this video next. Take a look at my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills. And until next time, stay awesome.